Okay. okay, our next interview is with uh, Fred Barron. And Fred, let's get a little bit of your background, uh, family, schools, where you grew up, what your parents did, siblings, et cetera, uh, wife, children, you know, the whole bit. Just okay, oh, I, I have all of those. Okay. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Harrison, New York with my parents, my father, Howard, who will come considerably into this narrative later, yeah. uh, my mother, Frances, they were both New Yorkers, my mother from Brooklyn, uh, and... I have one brother that I grew up with, a half-brother, my father's son from a previous marriage, lives in Chicago, and uh, I knew him, but never particularly well. Uh, I went to school in Westchester County, New York, college, University of Pennsylvania, got a bachelor's and master's in political science, and then went to Boston University Law School, graduated there. Um, I've been married for 30 years, have two children, one uh, just graduated Worcester Polytechnic Institute and okay. is, at, as of this moment, November 2011, looking for a job. The other <laughs> is... She's not alone. <laughs> <laughs> and she's not alone. And my younger daughter is a junior at Smith. Good school. And she loves it and hopes to go into education or psychology. She hasn't figured out which or some... Uh, Learning, uh, language acquisition is her, what, what she enjoys. Whatever that means. How people learn languages or learn to speak, you know, whether it's English as a second language or developmentally how one, two, three, four-year-olds learn to speak and communicate. That, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, John Jenkins once said of, of me that I have command of no language. Right. <laughs> so I'm not the right person to ask about that. Um, I know... Uh, how you were bitten by the book, but, yeah. but why don't you just tell everybody who's going to be watching this video uh, just what happened to you. Well, I was, my father was a collector for many from the 1950s on, and he particularly liked, well, he particularly liked everything, yeah. <laughs> but his collecting ran to maps and atlases, Books in general, but it was never literature. It was always historically oriented. But he also had collections of coins, and he, he and his brother had been in the stamp business, and he collected paper money and essentially everything under the sun. Uh, so, so I grew up around old paper, just for lack of a better term. Uh, when I was in my second year in law school, and seeing the people around me and the summer jobs they were getting and the summer jobs that I got interning at the National Labor Relations Board, I came to the determination that I think he had come to years ago that I was not cut out for a corporate life. <laughs> uh, he had always, to the extent that he could, work for himself. He had set up several businesses and a couple had succeeded and ultimately failed, but he had made a life, a good life out of it. But it was always working for himself, and I had that streak in me, too, that I was not cut out to be in middle, middle management and taking orders from, or directions from people that, whose directions I thought might, might not coincide with my interests or what I thought should be done. So I went to him and said, you know, at that point, this was 1982, and at that point he was turning 70 years old. Yeah. And I said, you know, I'd like to see if I'd come into the book business. He said, you know, because my rationale was I could always go back and practice law if I wanted to. Sure. He, getting on in years, if he, you know, something happened to him and the business were not to be there, I could not just suddenly yeah, move, into uh, move, move into a book business not having any background at all in it except that I enjoyed being around the material. So he said, finish law school, pass the bar, uh, and, you know, come back and we can do that. So I went through my third year of law school. I passed the bar exam. I had 102 fever the day I passed the bar exam, <laughs> but I passed it but in you New York. Passed it. Uh, I have actually kept up my bar membership ever since. Really? I have not let that lapse. The extent of my uh, serving or doing anything in the legal profession has been writing a few threatening letters for friends with a Frederick Barron Esquire letterhead <laughs> on it. Uh, but it has helped me just in the way I see things and 
you know, deal with problems. So I never regret having been to law school. It gave me exposure to that to say, no, this is not, you know, not what I want to do necessarily. Uh, so I went to 19, March of 1983. I started in the business with my father, and that summer I attended the rare book school in Denver, which is essentially to get the, root, the basics. Uh, you know, how to, how to write a description, you know, <laughs> what, right. what are the qualities of a book, things of that sort. And that was very useful, because my father was sort of a lone wolf. He, he had not had any formal training as a bookseller whatsoever. Seat of the pants guy. Absolutely seat of the pants guy, as far as buying, selling, everything. Right. He, I mean, you, you knew him very I well. I knew him very well. And I liked him a lot. He made a lot of good decisions. He would buy things and see the pants and make some bad decisions. <laughs> uh, but he bought what he liked, and he liked most everything in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, primarily American. Uh, but once again, for whatever reason, he, you know, his background and my background it was just never literature at all. Yeah. Uh, so I have never dealt in any way in, with literature. It's historically related travel exploration, I have drifted towards 19th century, 18th, 19th century maps and atlases uh, as a niche, which certainly at the time in the 80s when I was doing it, no one yeah. was really doing to any extent. Right. Uh, you know, I have never minded things and actually in some way prefer things you get a little dirtier and grittier, and that the appearance, I, I like to think for what it is, not necessarily the appearance. So sometimes my, I get criticisms from people. <laughs> my stuff doesn't always look the nicest and cleanest, but I like to think it's always interesting stuff at the and very and least. And functional. Yeah, and functional. So you know, going into American atlases, including county atlases, which no one had really done. Yeah as atlases as opposed to breaking them up and selling the maps to right, people. Right, that, that's what they used to do. For their walls. And uh, pocket maps, travel guides, wall maps in particular, I've got done a lot with over the years. And really, no one had, again, made that special because no one liked to deal with the things. They were the dusty. Big, they're big, big, and they take up space, and they're dusty and dirty, and yeah. inevitably in less than prime condition just by the, the physical nature of it gets rolled up, gets put in the basement or an attic. Yeah, it gets that's it. You know, dust, you know, a little cracking, and so they're, they're not all that attractive to deal with. But there's information on them, and there's history to them that unfortunately has my phone ringing, okay, well, <laughs> which I am sorry about. That's okay. We usually say to to close your cell phones when you come in, but we haven't been yeah. doing it lately. <laughs> well, I'm I'm sorry about that. Well, and I'm sorry uh, to whoever may be watching this. Uh, how was, uh, the question always is, when you're working with your father or yeah. working with a parent uh, in a business, um, how did you find it? Did you find it difficult? Did you find it uh, uh, easy? Uh, I knew your dad rather well. Uh, uh, he had a way of doing things. Uh, I found working with him incredibly easy. Oh, I great. loved my, I worked with him for 16 years before he passed away in 1999. And... He was the best partner I could ask for because he went in with the attitude, this is your business. You know, e even in the early you know, first couple of years, when I knew essentially nothing, and he went in, this is still your business, your decisions, you know, I will help, I will work with you, right. whatever, but uh, you know, I'm not going to be around forever. You have to take a direction that you want. The earliest things that I did was to narrow the focus because my father had no focus whatsoever. No, well, he, he liked to buy things. He liked, he liked to, buy. to buy things. He liked to buy, which can be a circus collection one day and yeah. an aviation collection the next day, and an individual book on uh, heraldry, and it just he was all over the map. Right. And he loved it. And that was him. That he was interested in everything, and he bought everything. And I had to. And it was also the nature of where the where book business was going at that time, it was heading towards specialization, clearly. Yeah. The, the day of the, uh, you know, John Sanderson was in here before, and he was, he's actually like that, but the day of the New England generalist go out and buy up collections of all kinds yeah. of different stuff was dying. Yeah. It, it just, the material and the, the world wasn't suited for that anymore. 
So the world was heading towards more specialization, so I pared off some of the uh, stray branches that he yeah. grew on and went more into Americana and the maps and the atlases than he had done. But um, the other significant thing that happened that gave us a direction was that we handled the residue of Rocky Gardner's uh, uh, a business. very well-known uh, New and, England books. Right, Ro I was going to get it. Rocky Gardner was a well-known base level. He was essentially a dealer for dealers. He right. went out and did the legwork and scared up stuff out of... Amazing. Out of amazing stuff out of who knows where. No one knows where. And he was you know, a compulsive buyer and he had a barn which was legendary and... I'm sure you went there, oh, yeah. and <laughs> we went there. On a regular there, basis. Everybody <laughs> went there, and you just started, it was like a mine, and you went to a, you know, <laughs> a shaft, and you started working it. Yeah. Because uh, this was 50-plus years of just accumulation. Um, so we worked with, we made the deal when Rocky was still alive, but for another month, maybe. Yeah. But mostly we dealt with Avis, his wife. Yeah who was the, the financial side of the operation, and she was a major furniture and paintings dealer. And from what we could tell after we had dealt with this accumulation was that it, she was the profitable side. <laughs> and he, he, his books and paper and all the rest the was, was a, the fun side, but a cost center rather than yeah. a profit center. But she, you know, they would go out, and you know, he would buy us station wagon load of all kinds of stuff and she would buy one high boy and sell it and that would be the profit and his <laughs> he wouldn't make an awful lot of money on his yeah. his material guy. but going through what was essentially the residue of his his uh, stock for lack of a better word uh, was we did and led us into you know, some different kinds of ephemera, but mostly trade catalogs that I've now. I was going to ask you about that. I've now, that's, that's, because that was a ready-made inventory right. of trade catalogs. There was good, there was bad, there was damage, there was beautiful, which was the nature of going through this, the barn and even and the house. It was just stuff that hadn't seen the light of day in 20 years, even to him. Yeah. Um, though I'm sure if, you know, if he'd been alive and you'd asked him, he could have given you chapter and verse because his memory was yes, infallible. was infallible. Because you know, you know, you you walk through the barn and the house and you'd pick out stuff and you you know put it down. And he'd give you prices: nineteen dollars on that, and thirty-eight dollars on that, and seventy-three dollars on that. And then you go back in the house and he'd write it up, and he would remember every price down to the penny for each right. item, and be able to give you the backstory on everything. So that's what led us into trade catalogs, which is our other. My other major spe specialty now, yeah. Um, but you know, doing that, uh, you know, it was stock, estate, whatever you want to call that, that relationship, brought a tremendous amount of you know, exposure for us to certain oh, uh, yeah. people and inventory and uh, was a, a significant thing that we did. And that was a, an awful lot of work to go through oh, yeah. for two people. We were lucky we were only about 15 miles from where they were, so we were <clears throat> really the only interested dealer within a, a reasonable distance because to, it, it wasn't the kind of place you could have just gone in and hauled it back, right. hauled in the truck and taken it away and worked off-site. Yeah. There was just too much, and just when we were, before we got started, there was a fire in the front part of the barn which had ruined years, stacks of Harper's Weeklies and newspapers and all kinds mm -hmm. of things, which fortunately did not, aside from some smoke, get into the rest of the barn, but there was oh, a front area of the barn that just was obliterated by smoke. So that, that was a major event in you know, taking, us, taking me where I am, what I deal with. So uh, besides Rocky and besides mm -hmm. your dad, who are some of the other people who had a, a major influence on you? Uh, as a bookseller? Uh, uh, those were the, the most important uh, ones, obviously. obviously. 
Uh, was there anybody yeah. else who, who uh, helped out after, uh, after Dad passed away, for example? Not really. At that no. point, that I, you was, were I was pretty well established mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, you know, I dealt with Dick Arkway a fair amount, bought mm -hmm. things from him, but it was as much as anything, it was my father and his okay. relationships and things, but I didn't. And I, to some degree, I missed that not having had an in the trade, you know, established dealer kind of mentor. Yeah. But it just it didn't happen that way. Well, your father was your in. Yeah, my father. My father was, but he wasn't, you know, an establishment. You know, whether it's Jenkins or Howell or yeah. Krauss or you know, and I'm missing dozens of other. Of course. Uh, you know, know established people, but so many of the people get their start working in one of the. Sort of apprentices. Uh, apprentices or low-level clerks or whatever, just, and they get familiar with the inventory and they get familiar with how you do the business and the customers and all the rest. And I, that's the one thing that I missed and never, yeah. never had in my training. Uh, what percentage uh, of your inventory is online? Uh, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say because it's a question of how I define my inventory. Because okay. I've got a lot of material ephemera and things that is in boxes and has been, you know, just, I don't really look at it of some worth, but not yeah. worth, I don't spend too much time on. Again, right. I'm a sole proprietor and, you know, my time is precious and to go through pricing things at $3 and $5 just Does, doesn't, doesn't make, make it also. <laughs> of the things that I have priced at, Let's say a hundred and fifty dollars or more, a hundred dollars more. Probably about eighty, eighty you know, to ninety percent is online in one form or another, either on, on my website or through AB Books or somewhere. Uh, what percentage of your business uh, comes from online sales? Uh, can you give me a rough figure? Um, at this point, it's still probably about twenty-five percent. Most of my business is still my contacts and. I call people or write people and quote things and the uh, direct sale. It, it's the direct. It's it's my bring things to or my catalogs, which I still do, and I know a lot of people don't, but I still think that. What percentage of your business comes out of your catalogs? Is it? It's, it's certainly not what it once was. It, it's it's not it's not what it once was. Uh, oh, fifteen percent or so now, but again, still the the major part is. Talking to people and making a deal, you know, with uh, you know, either having something, buying something with another dealer, and either I sell it or he sells it, right. or you know, I buy something, call the librarian or the dealer or the collector or whoever it is that. Uh, Basically, what I do too. And that, that's I think that's what, what a, that's the way we all used to do it, and I just. I can't change. I and, and I can't, <laughs> and I'm not going to change that much at this point, except to try to sometimes. Sort of hitch a ride with someone else's online right, uh, right. Um, presence. How many book fairs do you do in the course of a, a year, and and what part do they play in in um, in your business? When I started with my father, he probably did about f fifteen or so a year. And now, a lot of the book fairs that he did no longer even exist. Ex exist. Yeah. But I will. Only, I'm doing about six or so shows a year. Do you do most of the uh, ABAA shows? I, I, I always do the New York. I've done the Boston ABA show. This is my 29th straight year. I've done, I do New York every year. It's, it's convenient for me, so a lot of the expense yeah. gets cut down because I don't, I don't, I don't have to, I, I go home every night. It's yeah. half an hour for me to go yeah, home. Uh, I've missed, I think, including my folks, one year in the last 35 uh, I do the Miami Map Fair now, which is now a very good show it's for good me. Show. Yeah, that's a very good show for me. And I do the San Francisco Book Fair every other year. I don't. I used to do Los Angeles every year. I don't do that anymore. It, does, it doesn't. It didn't pay, and I started doing Miami Maps, which is right about the same time. Oh, and see. for me, doing the logistics of essentially doing separate inventories, some to Miami, some to San Francisco, getting some, and then sitting there on the floor in Miami at the end of the Miami show, separating this goes to San Francisco, this goes back home, oh, yeah, it, is, it be a drag. <laughs> <laughs> is a nightmare. Once every two years is quite enough yeah, I, I can see to go saying. through that. Um, 
One of the questions that I ask is, uh, if you were entering the book trade today, would you? And if you would, well, how would you go about doing it? I haven't even thought about that question. Obviously. I, 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 I have no idea. Well, the, the one area in which I've thought about it is with regard to my older daughter, who's currently unemployed. And if she said, you know, I want to do what you did and come in, and I would say, no, I want you to work. <laughs> that you should get some real life experience. You know, world experience first, and then we'll talk about it as opposed to the way I did it. Now, I'm younger than my father was at, yep. at a similar point. And his age played tremendously into my decision. Uh, and I think he recognized that as well. He was uh, a very perceptive person. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, while we never put it in those terms, obviously he knew that uh, you know, at age 70, at that, in the early 80s, yeah. that this was not a, something that could last right. forever. Um, I, the, the best advice would be, as it has always been, if you want to be a book dealer, deal in things that you love. Mm. Don't deal in something because you think that's where the money is yes. or because, or for any other reason. It, it will sort of evolve organically. If you do something you love and start dealing in it, you will succeed in it. If you force the issue and try to deal in something for some other reason, because someone's got a collection that you think you can do something with, but you don't really love this, the subject matter, you will not succeed. Mm. So th this is, and there are people who've made a lot of money in this, there are people who have not made a lot of money in this, That's but e for 90 plus percent, and I'm sure you've you know, been interviewing these people, it's a labor of love in the material that they are dealing Absolutely. with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the one, you know, for all the changes in this industry with the internet and communications and email, I mean, for whatever, that's the one constant is that the dealers have to deal in what they love or else they will not succeed. What do you see as some of the challenges facing the trade as we move forward in the next 5, 10, or 15 years? The biggest challenge that I see is and I'm hearing this from people that do antique shows and the book fairs, is that there seems to be a lessening of attachment to the thing, to things. That from antique shows, I'm hearing people aren't buying the old you know, antique furniture as much, and they're not buying at the top end, you know, old master, you know, you know impressionist paintings. That, that, that's a different world. But yeah. in the nuts and bolts, it, as People grow up with e-books and with online. They are dealing with physical books less. And I'm concerned that that lack of connection to current physical books will translate into, well, why do I need an older, <laughs> an old mm -hmm. book? Uh, and I can't predict where that's going to take the trade. I, I deal a lot with maps, and I think that that will suffer. That maps have come on a lot in the last 20 sure. years as a separate they're field. They're very visual. They're, they're very, people get a different form of mm. attachment to them. They get a visual and artistic attachment. They will get a geographic attachment. They like the, the place that it is, the style of the map, the pi whatever. Uh, that I think is l less relevant with books that. Uh, I think that, for instance, modern first editions that I have not ever particularly dealt with have been hurt tremendously by the internet and because some of the some of the particular books, when you go online and see 78 copies listed yeah, yeah. in various forms, that being able to sell it as a rare book has taken something of a hit. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of the things that I deal with, and one of the reasons that I don't rely online is that I do a lot of, whether it's ephemera or small, obscure things, is that I don't have things that people are looking for that title. They may be looking in a general area, but you have to describe it to the nth degree to make right. sure that everyone picks it up in their Google search. And even then, uh, you know, just yesterday I had a piece that I sold to someone 
that was that he bought because it was a related to military instruction for children. It was a thing of showing flags and soldiers, which I wouldn't have related to military. Yeah. 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 So, you know, he's he's got to find it, and I've got to sometimes put things under people's faces, you know, to say, you know, this is what I have, and not relying on their search, right? Because it may not find <coughs> find that thing that I have that they would like, and you know, they they don't even know it exists. That's the you, you've always operated uh, by appointment. Um, yeah. You've never, you've never had the open I've, shop experience. I, I have, we, we started working out of my parents' house, and after my father died, I did it with my mother, and she was still in the same house for six years. I was lucky enough uh, in 2000, the year 2000 actually, to find a house in my area where I was able to set up. There's a, I've got about 1,300 square feet of space directly attached to the house, separate entrance. You know, aside from I would like a little more space, it's really a dream kind of setup for, for a book dealer who doesn't have an open shop. So you're happy? Yeah, as, as far as <laughs> you know, my physical plant, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I close the doors and you know, I, I walk to work, feed the dogs, <laughs> you know, let them out in the middle of the day, uh, can't hear what's going you know, and, Watch the, and, and, and the, the business is physically segregated from right. the rest of the house. There's no, no overlap, no spillover of things, and my wife ensures that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it stops there. Yeah, that's where it stops. Yeah. And so we have stopped as well. We've got to the end of the, our session. Thanks very much, okay. Fred.